Good morning, everybody. It's 10 o'clock AM. It's time to start our Think Green Thursday class for November 5th, 2020. And today we're going to do a virtual demonstration of planting trees and shrubs with Mark Danieli, uh, our extension horticulture agent and acting CED right now. And uh, Mark, good morning. And morning. tell us all about this. If you, if you have questions, oh, by the way, I hate to interrupt, but uh, if you have any questions, just put them in the chat box and uh, we'll, we will um, get to them at the end. Okay, Mark, take it away. Okay, okay. good morning, everybody. So this morning we're talking about planting trees and shrubs. So it's a great time of the year to be planting things. So let's see, aha. There we go. Yeah, that's working. So uh, what happens most of the time is, uh, you know, people go to the garden store in the springtime and they find these things that are blooming and they take them home and plant them without really doing the thought process that you should do before you plant anything at your home. So we'll talk a little bit about the things that you should do before you buy the plants. And then we've got some pictures here where I planted a tree uh, out front last last week, Chris. Uh, yes. And so we were going to do a, a video initially, but since it took an hour and a half to plant one tree, it's a good thing we just have pictures and no video because that would be an awful long <laughs> video of me shoveling and sweating. Okay. So things to think about, uh, ideally, before you buy the, the plant would be uh, cold hardiness and heat tolerance. So, you know, we've got some things that you could plant here that just aren't going to make it. Uh, I've had calls about uh, some of these tropical hibiscus. Uh, they're not going to make it outside. I've got a North Carolina pine on the deck. And my wife said, well, let's just plant that in the yard. It's too big to bring in the garage. Nope, that's not going to make it. Uh, heat tolerance, you think about Fraser firs. A uh, good Christmas tree, but it's just too hot in the summertime for them to last long. White pines, another example. Uh, they'll live here, you know, we think 25, maybe 30 years, um, but they're just going to kind of uh, decline over a period of time, just not going to make it. They won't last as long here as they do up in the mountains where they can go for 60, 70, 80 years probably or, or more. Uh, microclimate, so you could have a place where uh, something will do really well. So we think about oriental persimmons. Uh, they're not particularly hardy here, but I go around town and I've seen some that have been here for years and years and years and done very well. So they've got a microclimate uh, where they're very happy uh, for some particular reason. There's one over on uh, Medina Street. I'm not sure it's still there, but that uh, persimmon is probably 30 feet tall, been there for many, many years, done great. So you could have a microclimate uh, in any particular spot around your yard where if you've got a plant that's not doing real well, just not happy, dig it up and move it uh, to a different place in the yard and it may have a, a different kind of microclimate there and then just be happier and, and do much better. A lot of requirement, you know, we've got some plants that won't full some, some want a lot of shade. Uh, again, this is one of those things that uh, there's some gray areas there. So there's some things that you would think that are full sun plants that would take some shade, some shade plants will take some sun. Again, it's kind of the thing where you just move the plant around till you find where it's happy. Uh, there's no problem with doing that as long as it's not gotten too big to move. Uh, moisture requirement. Whatever you plant, you're going to have to water at some point in time. I have a lot of questions about, you know, how much do I water and what's the schedule? So everybody would like to have a schedule. So you're going to water this plant uh, three times a week and two gallons a time. And it's just hard to do a schedule like that because it depends so much on the plant and the weather and the soil and everything else. So Sort of the bottom line is when you water, water thoroughly, let it dry down for a few days and water it again. Uh, and every plant's gonna have a little different requirements. Some plants need a lot of water. Some plants don't like a lot of water. 
So you have to know what the plant really prefers uh, in order to keep it happy. Uh, soil pH, uh, moisture and drainage. Typically our soil is very acidic and we need to correct that pH for our plants to be happy. Um, drainage is gonna be super important. We have soils here that don't drain well. And if you've got the plant in a place where it doesn't have good drainage, uh, something like the Zaya rhododendron is very uh, particular about drainage, uh, they're not gonna be happy. So you may have to amend the soil. And we'll talk about that in just a little bit. Uh, pest susceptibility. So you have to think about that idea before you plant something. So I've got hybrid tea roses. I'm second guessing that decision. Uh, beautiful plants, but my land, uh, every bug in the world and disease wants to get on my hybrid tea roses. So I've got to spray those things every week for powder mildew, black spot, aphids, thrips, you name it. You know, do you really want to have that kind of maintenance schedule? It's fine if you do, you have to understand going forward that some of these things are gonna have problems and you're gonna to have to deal with those problems to keep these plants alive. So you know what it is before you get into it, ideally. And then rate of growth and mature size. So you do need to know how big these plants are going to get, how much pruning you're going to have to do. So you look at something like a compacta holly and you think, well, compacta, that's going to be a small plant. Well, compacta hollies can easily be six foot tall. And if your windows are only three feet off the ground, that's going to be too big. Um, dwarf Burford hollies. So dwarf, you think that's going to be not a very big plant, but it's dwarf in comparison to Mama Burford, which is going to be 20 feet tall. So dwarf Burfords can easily be 10, 12 feet tall. I planted some of those uh, by our garage. It really, in that particular place, uh, along with other plants that were there, it was really my best choice. But my windows on the garage are probably no more than four and a half feet tall. So I know there's going to be a lot of pruning to keep those dwarf burfords under control so they don't get too big. Uh, it's not a problem. I just need to stay on top of them. Don't let them get out of hand, which I can easily do. Okay, so site preparation uh, is essential. Now we've got some soils here that don't drain well, and if we don't fix our site, it's going to be a problem. So the kind of the suggestion is either we modify the site, so we add organic matter, improve the drainage, or we pick a plant that's suited to that site. So we could have a situation where you've got, say, a condominium townhouse uh, built on a slab. So you've got a real low foundation, real low windows there. You may not be able to come in, bring in a lot of organic matter, build that bed up to improve the drainage, you may have to find a plant that would be tolerant of those conditions. So instead of doing a Japanese holly, you might do a dwarf yopon holly that's more tolerant of poorly drained conditions and more likely to live than a Japanese holly like a, like a hellerai. So you need to think about the conditions. Can you modify the conditions or, or not? So we've got soil here. Uh, that's not particularly well drained. So we've got to think about the soil. You know, can we modify it? Can we not modify it? Uh, what are our conditions that we have to deal with before we start to plant? And so planting is, is just much more than just, you know, digging a hole and chunking a tree in the clay. Um, we really got to think about improving the soil, uh, digging the right kind of hole in order to give these plants their best chance and you know under a lot of uh, conditions you know we've had construction the soil is compacted and so it's not like going out in the woods and, and digging in a more of a, a native natural environment so we've had construction here uh, that soil is compacted we've got to think about what we do to reduce that compaction to allow our plants to be happier there um, we have some situations where soil may not be compacted, uh, but it may just not park. So we'd have a lot of places around the county 
where our soil just won't perk. And we have to either modify that soil or be real particular about the plants we plant there in order for them to be happy in that situation. You look at a hill like this and, and you would think that that could be a well-drained area because it is on a slope. And so you've got real good surface drainage there, but there are cases where the internal drainage in the soil itself is not good. So you could have problems with drainage even on a slope because the soil itself uh, doesn't drain well. So you've got good surface drainage, but it could get wet inside the soil and not drain well. So you really have to think about that too. Even on a slope, the drainage can be real important. You can go in there and put in uh, drain tile in some situations uh, that can help, but it's very tricky. And if not done properly, that can actually make things worse. So that's kind of the last resort for drainage problems put in subsurface drainage if you can. Ideally, we'd be correcting that problem on top of the ground, uh, either with a raised bed or uh, amending the soil some other way. Raised beds can be, certainly be helpful in the situation. So we are raising the soil up adding organic matter in there, improving the drainage and aeration for some of these plants that are, are fussy about having wet feet. Uh, this can be real helpful to make them happy and, and have them survive better. So certainly one of the more important things we do is going to be amending the soil. So adding in organic matter there, whether it's a pine bark fines or a leaf compost in order to uh, improved drainage. So they're talking about increasing the soil's ability to hold water, but that would be more important on a sandy soil down east. For us, we're trying to increase the soil's ability to drain. So as it is, our soils hold plenty of water, probably too much in some cases. So we're trying to help improve the drainage and aeration and the organic amendments will certainly help with that. Talk a little bit about uh, pH, as I said earlier, uh, typically our soil here is very acidic. So most of the plants we were planting would probably be happy at a pH of say six to six and a half. Our soil naturally down here is probably more in the low five. So we've got to add some pH, I've got to add some lime in there to increase the pH, uh, neutralize that acidity so our plants are, are happier. So soil testing, something uh, we always recommend. Uh, soil testing is free up until Thanksgiving. Uh, we have the soil test uh, boxes here in our office. So while the uh, front door is locked, you can get into the little foyer area. We've got soil uh, test boxes there and the information sheet. You can come get your boxes, get your samples and make them down to Raleigh. And then they'll do the testing for you. Um, I mailed six boxes in, I think in September for my yard and it cost me like 10 bucks to mail six uh, samples to Raleigh. So it's not very expensive and it does give you some real good information about uh, how much fertilizer, what kind of fertilizer you need in order to make your plants happy. So we're saying don't guess. Uh, and I could guess a little bit there, but really better to, to not have to guess about what nutrients you need, get the soil sample, and that's going to help you make a decision about what you can do to improve the, the growth and health of your plants. Uh, real quick on fertilizer, so just so you understand that on a 10-10-10, uh, that is the amount of nutrients in the bag. So the first number is nitrogen, second number is phosphorus, third number is potassium, and that ratio can change. Uh, it could be a triple 17, it could be a 16, four, eight, doesn't really matter. It's always gonna be NPK. And so what that's telling you in this 10, 10, 10 is that 30% of that bag is actual nutrients. The other 70% is just a filler, uh, just to make it a little bit easier to spread. So uh, and it doesn't really matter, particularly what the name is on the bag. So we've got, a tomato plant food here, uh, evergreen flowering, tree and shrub fertilizer. 
Uh, we're really concerned just about is what the analysis is here. So you've got a, a 12, 10, 5, 11, 7, 7, and they're fairly identical as to the uh, proportion of nutrients in the bag, and it really doesn't matter. So if you had some tomato plant food and want to put it on your zegas, it's fine. It doesn't make a difference at all. It's the uh, numbers on the bag that are important and not the name on the bag or the, or the picture. It doesn't make any difference to the plants at all. Um, so compost is a good thing to add to our soil. So that's uh, like a leaf compost as a good organic matter to help improve the drainage. Um, the bold print there says reduces fertilizer requirements. It does to a little point. It's not going to be all of the fertilizer the plants might need, but it will help uh, somewhat. It does improve the soil structure there. And at the bottom, it talks about disease suppression. So we do have bad uh, microorganisms in the soil. We've got good ones too. The compost can help encourage some of the good uh, microorganisms uh, that are in the soil there and help suppress some of the root rots and things that we may be dealing with there. So good things about uh, compost. You do have to be careful. Some of the commercially available compost uh, have a real high uh, lime content and also a real high phosphorus content. So over a period of time, you can end up with high pH and a high phosphorus index. So you really need to do soil samples if you compost uh, much, use much compost to make sure that you don't run the pH and the phosphorus level up too much. Uh, peat moss is something that uh, works very well in the sandy soils, but not so good here in our clay soil. So it's a very fine textured product. Our clay soil is a very fine textured uh, soil. They don't mix well together. We need something that's coarser uh, like a pine bark or a leaf compost uh, would be better than uh, peat moss for our soils. We also want to make sure it's fairly well uh, decomposed. So something that's kind of a raw bark, a big chunky bits are not going to be as good as a soil amendment as a, a very well decomposed uh, pipe bark. Okay, and then how much to use. So generally we're looking for a 50% a uh, by volume. So we're trying to get maybe a three inch depth of soil amendment uh, tilled into a six inch depth of soil. So it gives you a little bit of a chart here. So we know that that's about a one cubic yard over a hundred square foot area. That's a good number to think about there. So as you're trying to figure up, uh, you're going to put soil amendment into a, a plant bed, flower bed, uh, you can have a pretty good idea if you know how many hundred square feet you've got, how many cubic yards of amendments you might need to apply and till into that uh, area. So there we're adding the pine bark fines, adding that in, tilling that in, trying to create a really good planting bed for whatever uh, trees or shrubs you're going to plant. And that's the ideal situation, if you can, is to amend the whole bed if we're planting just a single tree like we're getting ready to do in a minute, uh, that's going to be a different situation. But ideally, if you're starting uh, foundation plantings or a flower bed around the house, we would want to amend uh, the whole area there, have a better root zone for the plants to grow in. So we're trying to plant in well-prepared beds with lots of organic matter. The soil is going to be very well aerated. And then we've raised it, of course, to improve the drainage. So you're going to have more success uh, with your plants if they are in uh, a well amended and, and raised bed kind of situation. So we can plant theoretically uh, any time of the year. I would say now uh, is probably the best time. Uh, we plant now. The plants have time to grow roots over the winter time, get well established. You're still going to have to water these things next summer for sure, but they'll be more established than say something you might plant uh, next spring. You can still go ahead and plant really any time of the year. Just got to be real particular as you go into spring and summer to not go off and let these things get dry because they'll, they'll die on you really quick. 
uh, planting depth uh, same or higher than what the root ball is. Uh, we don't want to dig the hole any deeper than the root ball. So I actually like to set anything I'm planting at least an inch above grade or maybe two inches um, just because we know we have soil that's not very well drained. We want to make sure that these plants have a, a good shot of living. So we want to plant them a little bit high. Uh, here's a pretty good picture here. So it's showing that the bottom of the hole is solid. Uh, we haven't dug this deep and messed that up. So the bottom of the hole is solid. And then the top of the root ball there is probably an inch below the grade. Got a nice wide hole there. The mulch comes up to the edge of the root ball, but it's not on top of the root ball. So really most of our plants is, is pretty important to have uh, the top of the root ball exposed. So you can check to see if it's getting dry, is it too wet? Uh, let the root ball breathe some, it's fine. It doesn't hurt a thing. Uh, you don't need to have the mulch piled up around the uh, trunk of the plant. We want to make sure we always water our plants before planting. Uh, virtually all these container plants are grown in a pine bark mix. Once that pine bark gets dry, it repels water. So it's really hard to get them wet once they're in the ground. So you want to make sure that you water them well in the pot, make sure the pot soil is nice and moist before you start to plant them. And you want to handle the plants real carefully. So you don't want to grab the top of the plant and just yank it out of the pot. You know, ideally you lay the pot on the side and kind of slide the plant out and roll it into the hole. Uh, also I want to check to see you know, if there are any uh, girdling roots, uh, root bound plants, those roots should be loosened or, or cut. So you could have a situation like this where, you know, that's pretty root bound. You don't really want to just chunk that in the ground as it is. Those roots need to be loosened up or cut to get them to spread out into the soil and not just keep on circling around in that same uh, shape they're in now. So you take your fingers and loosen them up, uh, take a knife and cut them. You actually can slice off um, the outside maybe half inch of the entire root ball to get rid of those circling roots. All of those things are fine to help loosen up any kind of situation where you've got a, a pot down plant. So plants in beds don't require a, a water uh, basin. And really for most of the even individual trees that you put out to the yard, you don't really need that as long as you do a good job of watering, you don't necessarily have to have a uh, ring around the trees. And then you, you do want to definitely have some mulch uh, around the planting area there. Um, and one thing that does, especially for our trees in the yard, it protects the trees from lawnmowers and weed. So don't really want to have grass growing up to the trunk of a tree in the yard. Uh, it's going to get bumped by the lawnmower and be damaged. And then you're going to have a decay and there's going to be a real problem there. Uh, real quick on the water. So when we decide to water, we do want to water very thoroughly. So you really can't put on too much water at one time. So the goal would be water thoroughly, let the plant dry down for several days and water when it needs it again. Uh, sometimes people want to go out there on a daily basis and just kind of squirt the soil, uh, but that watering on a too frequent basis, you'll end up with situation, the picture on the right-hand side there, you've got a very shallow root system. Uh, it's not well established. Um, if you continue to water like that, that's fine. But if you just go off to the beach for a week and you have a plant that's not well established, I and mean, it's going to suffer much more so than a, a plant that has a very well established deep root system. It's going to withstand uh, not being watered for several days much better than one with a very shallow root system. Okay, uh, talking about mulch there, uh, two to four inches uh, help prevent the water loss there, uh, insulate the roots, reduce some of the weed competition. All those things are good. Uh, but what I do want to say is I really like the organic mulches uh, better. So on occasion, people will use you know, brick chips or stones, and that's fine if that's your personal preference. But I really rather have an organic mulch um, pine needles here 
that's going to break down over a period of time and add some more organic matter to the soil. So uh, pine bark, pine needles are probably my favorite. Uh, people use a lot of hardwood mulch and it's okay, uh, but it does have some limitations. It does tend to mat down and doesn't breathe as well as pine bark. You also can have some fungi grow on there. So there's a, a artillery fungus uh, that can shoot spores out onto uh, your car or the side of the house and some slime molds, some dog, dog vomit uh, fungus grows on the hardwood mulch. It's not very attractive. So uh, you can use that, but what you'd have to do is go out there periodically with a rake and kind of rake that hardwood mulch around uh, to break up those uh, fungi so they don't form those slime molds. You know, back in the day, we used a lot of black plastic to hold the weeds down, but it turned out that really didn't work uh, very well. It held moisture, and then if you had a weed like Bermuda grass, you would grow up underneath the black plastic until it got to the plant, and then it became real hard to spray or pull. And so really at this point in time, we don't recommend uh, black plastic. Uh, probably some of these landscape fabrics, uh, that where they say they're permeable, they don't always do a good job. So I would be inclined to avoid black plastic and landscape fabrics as best you can. Um, they sometimes aren't as beneficial as what you would think they might be. And I'm talking about mulch, you know, a little bit of mulch is good. A lot of mulch is not better. Uh, you can see some of this volcano mulching around where the landscapers come back in on an annual basis and they're being paid to put out mulch. And so they just keep piling it up, piling it up. And you can get this uh, mulch volcano here that's 12 inches deep. And that's not good for the tree. Uh, you're gonna have some decay starting on the trunk. You're gonna have roots forming up there where they shouldn't be. So two to four inches is good. We definitely do not want to have uh, 12 inches like we've got there. Okay. So now we're getting ready to plant the tree out in front of the building there. So we've got a nice uh, red bud there. It's going to go in beside the, the garden. Uh, so we're sort of looking around to figure out, you know, where's uh, the tree going to be uh, happy and where's it going to fit into our landscape very well. There's our red bud tree there in a 15 gallon uh, pot. Uh, the first thing we want to do is look up. So we got utility lines out there in front of the building. Uh, but we're back probably 30 feet or so from the utility line. So that's extremely important. Uh, the red bud probably would not be a problem underneath the utility lines because it's not going to get that big. But you know, if you're planting something like a red maple or a willow oak, you need to be real careful to look up to see where the utility lines are. So if you go out, university drive back toward Target, uh, they have plant planted willow oaks there along University Drive directly under power lines. And they've been topped uh, by Duke Power three or four times now. That's a real problem. That was something that somebody messed up on big time. Uh, always look up and think about the utility lines there. If you're going to plant underneath, have something that's compatible like dogwood, redbud, something. Uh, if it's a big tree, get away from the utility lines. So we're, we're checking there and make sure that we don't have a conflict in the future. Uh, then we're looking down. So let's check and see uh, what's there. You know, are there underground utilities? So that uh, orange is probably is a telephone line there. So we did call the 811 service uh, before we started the plant to make sure there are no utility lines out there that I might dig into while I'm digging the hole for the tree. We do know there is a, a power line that goes from the building out to the flagpole in the garden, uh, but I'm still 10, 12 feet away from that. We know where that is. So we're really careful to look above, look for utility lines above ground, as well as what might be below ground to make sure we don't uh, plant our plant in the wrong place and, and cut a utility line. Okay, so now we found where the tree is gonna be. We know we don't have any problems with utility lines. Uh, it's plenty far away from the Coosa dogwood that's uh, close to it. It's far enough away from the garden. It's not going to really interfere there. It's far enough away from the sidewalk. 
So I've got a good location there. So right now I'm measuring the root ball because we want to ideally have our planting hole at least as twice as wide as the root ball uh, of the plant. So I've got to measure that and then figure out. So that root ball is about 17 inches across. So I need to have probably at least a 34 inch wide hole in order to put that tree in and have enough space to backfill it, tamp the soil, move the tree around, get it straight, do everything that you need to do. Uh, you don't want to dig a hole just big enough to just squeeze this thing in because you can't do a good job of backfilling it and it's not going to be happy um, unless it's got some room to, to grow and get some roots established. So now I'm just coming around and I'm marking uh, the width of the hole. So I'm saying, okay, if the root ball is 17 inches, uh, I'm going to add uh, nine inches to the diameter of the pot and make a circle there so I know exactly how big a hole to dig for this particular tree. Take, take measure and so I'm making some marks on the ground and I'll come back in there and, and make a circle uh, so I'll know what the, the size of the hole should be so I can dig that out to get a good hole. So there's my, there's my mark. And so now I'm coming around, I've moved the tree out of the way. I'm coming around where I've painted my circle. I've got a sharpshooter shovel there and I'm going through there and cutting out the uh, border of the hole with the sharpshooter. So I've got a good clean edge there to work with. And now coming back and digging up the turf and weeds that are inside that circle. So there's a lot of Bermuda grass in there, some other weeds and things. I wanna get that uh, dug up and and out of the way so it doesn't get mixed back into the soil that I'm gonna backfill the hole with there. So clean all that up and it goes in the wheelbarrow. I'm gonna roll that around behind the building and put it in a hole back there. So I've got a good clean uh, area to work with. So I finished cleaning off that sod, um, Bermuda grass, weeds and all. And so now I'm, I'm pretty close to what my 34 inch wide hole should be. And so now I'm at this point, I'm ready to start, start digging the hole. Um, so I've laid a tarp out there. So it just makes my cleanup a little bit easier. Uh, so as I'm digging the hole, I'm putting the soil on the tarp. Uh, so when I get ready to finish, I don't have soil laying out in the yard that I've got to try and rake that up. It's make my cleanup a whole lot easier to work with. So now I'm just digging and it took a pretty good while uh, when you think about a uh, 34 inch wide hole down to say 12, 13 inches deep. Um, I'm glad we have pictures and not video because that was time consuming. Um, and then I'm checking for the depth. So we've got to make sure we don't want to dig the hole too deep. We want to make sure the bottom of the hole is good and solid. So I'm looking at the depth of the root ball in the pot. And it's about 14 inches deep. So I'm really looking for, say, a 12 at most, a 13 inch deep hole. I want to make sure the bottom of the hole is good and solid. And that the root ball of the tree is going to be above grade. So it's got uh, a good chance to survive and not be planted too deep. So I'm digging some, I lay my rake across there. They gave me a straight edge. So I'm measuring the hole. Um, wasn't quite deep enough at that point there, probably at you know, less than 10 inches. So I'm trying to dig a little bit, measure a little bit. I don't want to get uh, too deep and then have a chance of having a loose soil in the bottom of the hole that may settle and it settles and it makes the root ball uh, too deep and then can run into some real problems there. So trim out a little bit more, trying to get the depth that, that I need for the tree. Measure again, getting real close at that point to what I think is gonna be the adequate depth of the hole for the tree. But I'm going to go ahead and just set that pot in the hole uh, so that I'm still looking to make sure that my depth is right. I want it to be a little bit above grade, but not too much. So I'm still checking to make sure that I've got the tree at the right depth uh, where it's going to be happy. 
still not quite there. Trim out just a little bit more of the bottom of the hole to get to where we really need to be to have the proper depth and width hole, planting hole for this tree. Uh, then I've got to get some organic matter. So you know, typically uh, a lot of the references will say that you're going to backfill this tree with the soil that comes out of the hole. So whatever the clay soil is, it's got to grow in that native soil at some point in time. So a lot of references say, just use that same soil that came out of the hole for a backfill. Um, but my philosophy is that if you're going from a 100% pine bark root ball uh, into 100% clay, um, I'd love to have a little bit of a transition area so I usually try to have like a 50-50 mix in my backfill. So I'm going from 100% pine bark to like a 50-50 native soil um, organic material mix. And then the roots can get out into the native soil at some point. Now, I just think it's a it's an easier transition for the plant than going straight to the native soil. So we've got a pile of leaf compost over here. Uh, unfortunately, when we had that delivered, we weren't really thinking about how aggressive the roots are with the silver maple where we dumped it. So the silver maple is taking over the entire uh, pile of leaf compost. So I have to take the mattock and chop through the roots to get some uh, loose leaf compost to put in the wheelbarrow. So that was a little bit more of a chore, but uh, we made that happen. So scooped up some leaf compost. You can see all the roots that are growing in there. So we should have put a tarp down first um, we won't make that mistake again. Uh, Silver maple has got some really good roots there. You know, I got some leaf compost in the wheelbarrow, pulled out as many roots as I possibly could. Then I start mixing in native soil. So I'm trying to get a, about a 50-50 mix there, native soil leaf compost to use as my backfill to help the tree transition from 100% pine bark pot and soil into a 50-50 mix before the roots actually hit uh, the native soil. So I get about a 50-50 mix in the wheelbarrow there. Then I'm gonna start mixing that together uh, along with some lime and fertilizer. So we know most likely with that red soil that it's gonna be uh, low pH. We need to neutralize that uh, acidity some with some lime. Um, pretty strong possibility that's going to be low in phosphorus. Uh, so we want to add some fertilizer in there. Uh, some of the recommendations say, don't put fertilizer in when you're planting. But I feel like if you're mixing this in the backfill mix uh, and you use a reasonable amount, it's not going to hurt anything. So you don't want to throw a whole handful of 10, 10, 10 straight on the root ball. You can burn roots that way. But if you're mixing this together in the backfill mix, it's not really going to be a big problem. This is something I've done for years and years and had good success with it. So it's not a problem at all. So we had a pellet lime, a uh, powder lime would have been a little bit better, but the pellet lime still works to help break down the uh, acidity in the soil. Uh, 10, 10, 10 is, is fine. It's what we had here. So I'm putting that in there. So with this wheelbarrow load here, I use uh, two handfuls of lime and one handful of 10, 10, 10. It's not a particularly accurate measurement, uh, but with just experience over a number of years, that works fine. So getting some lime, some fertilizer in there to sort of uh, neutralize the acidity, get some phosphorus in the soil and help the plant get off to a, a, to a good start. So put the lime and fertilizer in there um, and I start to mix this together once I've got everything in there. And so I'm chopping up the clods, uh, trying to flip this around mix in the organic matter, the leaf compost with the native soil. Again, this took several minutes, so I'm glad this is pictures and not, not video. So mix and mix and mix in, it takes a pretty good while to get this. Uh, so I'm ending up though with a pretty nice 50-50 um, mix of native soil and the leaf compost. Um, now I'm ready to put the tree in the hole, so I'm gonna lay it down on the side and try to slide the root ball out of the pot. Uh, so sometimes you may have to tap on that uh, pot a little bit to get the plant loose, but you want to ease it out best you can. Just don't jerk it straight up uh, and damage some of the roots or the crown of the tree. So we'll slide it out 
uh, on the ground beside the hole to easing the pot off there. We look at the roots to see if we have a root bound situation where roots need to be loosened up. Doesn't look too bad. So the roots look pretty good. It's not real root bound. Uh, we can go ahead and put this in the hole. Just kind of roll it and ease it in there as careful as I can, I'm trying to hold the root ball so I don't uh, hold it by the trunk of the tree and put too much pressure on the root system there. I'm trying to ease it in as careful as I can, not break the root ball off or damage the tree in any way. And then once I get it there, then I'm, I've got to get the tree straight. Uh, so you don't really want to grab it by the trunk and start pushing it over. I'm trying to take my foot on the root ball. I'm trying to move the root ball itself to straighten the tree up and not pull the trunk over and bend the trunk. Uh, before I start to plant, I'm coming back with my sharpshooter there and I'm gonna cut around the root ball probably three or four different places. I'm going in probably an inch inside the root ball in case there are some circling roots uh, inside the root ball that I couldn't see and there were. So it actually turned out uh, as I started doing this, I hit some circling roots inside the root ball that weren't obvious uh, when we pulled out of the pot. So I'm gonna go around and uh, probably three or four different places, uh, take my sharpshooter, cut down through the outside of the root ball there to cut any circling roots that might be there that could cause a problem for the tree a little later on. Now I'm starting to backfill there. So I've got my 50-50 mix of uh, leaf compost and native soil in the wheelbarrow, the atom lime fertilizer, that's all mixed together. So I'm going back in there now to backfill the tree. Now I'm checking to see if it's straight. So I use my shovel as a plumb bob there. Chris is on the other side. So we're looking at it from two different angles, 90 degrees apart to make sure we want to get this tree as straight as we can uh, in the hole. And so we look at it, put some soil in there, uh, move the root ball around where we have to to try and get this tree as straight as we possibly can. Continuing to backfill, uh, there's some literature that would say, you know, you fill the hole about halfway, then you water that soil to get it to settle. I don't really like doing that. It, it's messy and I can do a pretty good job of firming the soil up with using the shovel and, and just using my foot and tamping the soil. So I'm backfilling, I'm gonna get to be half or maybe two thirds of the way full. Then I'm gonna come around and just take my foot and sort of gently firm that soil around the tree. As long as that soil is not too wet, that's not gonna be a problem. If the soil is wet, you could have a compaction issue there, but with the amount of organic matter in the soil and the fact that it's fairly dry, I can tamp it pretty well with my foot, settle any voids in the air pockets that are in there, uh, chunk it some with the shovel, and that worked perfectly well to do that. So I'm just uh, backfilling, tamping the soil a little bit, uh, making sure that the root ball is firm and the tr tree trunk is still good and straight. Uh, get close to the end, I just dump the rest of the soil there. I don't have enough in that one wheelbarrow load to completely finish planting the tree, so I'll pour that out, spread that around, and go back and get some more uh, leaf compost away from the silver maple. Come back, repeat the process, more lime, more fertilizer, more native soil, mix it all together, and then go back and, and try to finish uh, back filling around the root ball. Root balls, again, probably an inch or so uh, above the grade of where the, where the grass and weeds are. Uh, still going back in there, tamping a little bit more, trying to get it back filled the way it should be, uh, dumping out what's left in the wheelbarrow, uh, still backfilling. Now I'm coming back through there now. I don't want any of my backfill mix on top of the root ball. The root ball needs to be exposed to the air. Uh, we always go out there and check that root ball, see if it's moisture or not. So I'm, I'm pulling the backfill mix off the top of the root ball there, spreading it around kind of evenly around the tree so that uh, it's going to be happy. Rake it out a little bit there, make everything kind of neat and clean. 
Uh, now I'm going back and looking. So I broke a branch in planting the tree. So anytime you have a, a broken branch or something that's misshapen, you go back and, and trim that. So we're not really going to cut anything off other than anything that's broken. So you can sort of see the little broken branch uh, in there. I'm going to cut that off because I don't that, that need to stay there. And I think I had another little kind of twisted up little branch in there that wasn't in good shape and went ahead and cut that off. We'll leave that stake on there probably until springtime to give that tree a chance to uh, grow some roots out and give it some support. Uh, and probably by springtime, we'll take that bamboo stake out uh, so the tree can sort of flex and bend and, and become strong and, and do well. So there's our finished uh, planting tree. Thank goodness that was an hour and a half of hard work. And uh, Chris joined in and, and gave it a good watering. So at this time of year, a new planted tree, uh, good watering like that. That may be all the watering we have to do uh, for this fall and winter. The leaves are going to fall off within 30 days, uh, certainly. Uh, if it's an evergreen tree, you may have to water it some over the winter time because we could have a period over the winter time, uh, sunshine, wind blows, gets kind of warm. Evergreen tree would transpire and need to have some water. But a deciduous tree like this, a good water when it's planted, will probably hold it all winter long and be perfectly fine and happy. Then there's our finished tree. So tree planting is done. Okay, Chris. Um, oh, Cynthia says she loves the location. The tree will be very happy there. We had one question. Okay. Um, uh, okay. She had the same, uh, this, this person had the same problem with her tree roots growing into the um, into the compost and she wondered if it was still okay to use the compost and, and she wondered if there was a concern for root rot or not so much as the root is no longer attached to the tree. So, yeah, I wouldn't um, worry about the root rot there so that when we cut a lot of roots, there's a lot of roots in that leaf compost and we chopped a lot of those off and I pulled out as many as I could when I was mixing the soil, but I would not be concerned at all about using a compost would have some other roots in it. That's not. not they will. Issue. They'll just decompose with the rest of the compost. I would imagine. Yes. Yes. Be fine. No, not, not a problem at all. Okay. And uh, earlier, Cynthia said Bryce Lane says, "Think about the whole, not the whole," and that sounds a lot better when you see it in print because it's the think about the W H O L E, not ah, the H O L E. <laughs> so making making a nice planting bed is a great idea. So that's what you're. That that's what you're trying to do, right? Right. Oh, wait, there's make more messages. Hold on, hold everything. Okay. 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 Oh dear. Oh my. Okay. Um, this person, Jim, said he planted an oak leaf hydrangea, and the deer stripped the leaves. It looks like a bamboo stake. Will it survive winter? That I think it will survive winter, but I'm I'm surprised because the high, the deer have not touched my hydrangeas. Hmm. You have anything to say about that? I think it'll be fine. Yeah, I, I would think so. I mean, the leaves are going to fall off soon anyway, as long as there's not, you know, a lot of structural damage, breaking up branches at all, it probably would be okay. And it's probably had enough moisture, uh, but keeping, you know, I would make sure that uh, unless we have a super dry winter, which so far it's not, I wouldn't worry about no. watering it anymore. No, I wouldn't. I wouldn't think so. Okay. Well, that's all except thanks. Thank okay. You. Done and done. Oh, I think that's all. Wait, I've heard several times that hydrangeas are loved by deer. Well, oh. don't tell my hydrangeas, please. <laughs> don't tell your deer. <laughs> don't tell my deer. Yes. Don't tell my deer, please. <laughs> They're having too much fun in my vegetable garden, I suppose. Uh, yes. <laughs> So anyway, that would be a good plant, a good candidate for a deer away spray. It sounds like it. Yeah. So, well, thank you, Mark. That was a, a great program, great tutorial. Um, nice to have not be standing outside watching you dig a hole. 
<laughs> yes, it's a whole lot better, and, and it's a it's a beautiful tree. I'm I'm excited about that. Me too. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mark and Chris. This is Jeff and Linda. Oh, You're hi, welcome. Jeff and Linda. Thank you. You are welcome. So we'll see you soon. Going to okay. end the program. That's right. Okay. Bye, everybody. <laughs>